Marathon running is not for the faint of heart. You are selectively choosing to do something that the first guy who ever did it killed him and then choosing to do that for 26.2 miles, not to mention the other countless amount of miles that you have run behind the scenes that no one else sees. I can't think of a better metaphor for life, business, and our current times, actually, than marathon running, simply because social media makes everything seem like a highlight reel. And when you see people in person, you see their masks. Or maybe you are seeing the real them, but you and they're showing up smiling and looking amazing and look like they have all their shit figured out. But you are not seeing the daily hours that they are putting in behind the scenes, working on themselves, working on their business, working on their relationships, being a great parent and consistently day after day showing up for themselves to meet themselves where they're at so that the race they are in is for the race of their lives. Whether you want to run marathons or not, these lessons are applicable to any challenging situation in your life because I guarantee you there is behind the scenes stuff going on that no one else sees but you. And yet it's those moments and the behind the scenes when it is you and your creator that your self-worth is crafted So this podcast episode is for those who are choosing to do hard things, for those who are choosing to take on a challenge consciously or unconsciously and say, all right, whether I chose to do this or it chose me, I am following this through to the finish line and I am crossing that finish line. Hopefully this podcast will leave you feeling like you are not alone and that this process will be rewarded and you will feel phenomenal when you cross the finish line. Welcome to the Crown Yourself Podcast, where together we build your empire and transform your subconscious stories about what's possible for your business, body, and life. I'm your host, Kimberly Spencer, founder of crownyourself.com, and I'm a master mindset coach, best-selling author, TEDx speaker, known to my clients as a game changer. Each week, you get the conscious leadership strategies you need to help you reign with courage, clarity, and confidence so that you too can make the income and impact you deserve. Imagine this podcast as your royal invitation to step into your full potential and reign in your divine purpose. Your sovereignty starts here and your reign is now. Hello, hello, my fellow sovereigns, and welcome back to another episode of the Crown Yourself Podcast. I am so excited and honored to be here with you today, as always, because we are choosing to create a life business body by our own rules, on our own terms, doing as we do, because that is what it means to be sovereign, owning our choices and living in authentic alignment with our highest selves. And speaking of, I felt like I was living my best life <laughs> in LA um, for a hot minute. Like, I, as you know, we moved from Los Angeles to outside of Austin, Texas, and best move we could have ever made. Like, we are so excited. We love where we live. And two months after we move, I had uh, the mastermind that I'm a part of, Peter Diamandis' A360 Mastermind, was having their annual get-together. And I just decided to coincide this simultaneously to rearrange our Lion King tickets that we were supposed to have in, in LA in February, but then we moved in January, so moved those into March. Moved the LA Marathon. Well, I didn't move the LA Marathon, but I chose to run the LA Marathon since I didn't run the Disney World marathon that I was planning on running because of moving in January. So I said I still was going to keep my commitment, still was going to run a marathon, still was going to do the dang thing. And oh my lordy, did I resist the training. I was in like total resistance mode for a long time until I finally had to like woman up and make the motherfucking decision, like full embodied decision of like, I am going forth with this. I signed up for this. I committed to this. I'm not backing down again. I started out the marathon 
you know, we you wake up super early in the morning. So Spike was up. My mom was up. The kids were still asleep. I kissed them goodbye. I got, I was all taped up. I freaking looked like I, like just a patchwork quilt with all my KT tape, which was a game changer, by the way. Like get the support that you need. What a lesson. Um, Just the KT tape alone changed the piriformis pain that I was having for miles I had none of it, none of it in 26.2 miles, none of it thanks to the KT tape. This is not like, (laughs) I'm not sponsored by them. I just love that brand and I will leave a link in the show notes because if you are a runner or you want to do any sort of athletic thing and you have any sort of injuries or anything or any sort of pains or issues, KT tape, I am, I swear by it. I literally swear by it because it changed the entire way my body, my entire body mechanics were running. So I got all taped up early morning and I am ready to go. Spike is driving me. I'm just like sitting there. I have my coffee. I ate my breakfast because I normally do intermittent fasting. But before you go to a marathon and run 26.2 miles, you might want to eat some something. So I had some avocado toast, um, some good carbs, healthy fats, along with my bulletproof coffee with mushrooms. And I, not mushrooms as in psychedelics, like mushrooms as in, uh, you know, lion's mane, reishi, chaga, (laughs) those mushrooms. I use a mushroom powder in my coffee every morning. And so we're driving there. And then as we're driving, I'm seeing the traffic. Oh boy. Like we're good on the traffic until like about 30. Like I'm looking at the traffic around Dodger Stadium, which is where the LA Marathon starts. And it is stopped, like stopped on the freeway, the 110. It's because they closed off one of the off ramps to get off the freeway. And so in order to get to the, to the, up to, onto the mountains, the way LA is structured, you have to, and the way the freeway is, because they closed off that off ramp, because there was an accident, they li- the police blocked off the off ramp completely and the traffic was stopped. And it was saying that it would take about 30 minutes for us to just get up the mountain to the starting point of the marathon. Now, at this point, it was already about 6.15. Marathon started at 7 o'clock. Um, and I knew that if I was going to finish before they started closing on the roads, I would, uh, within my, you know, five and a half, six hour time frame, less than six hour time frame for my goal, then I would have to be there promptly at 7. So as we're stopped on the 110 freeway, um, I was looking around and like the, and by stopped, I mean parked. There was very, very, very little movement on the freeway period. And I start to look, I look out my window and I, and I know I'm seeing all the runners cause they're in their athletic wear. They've got their, uh, you know, signage on their chests or on their legs or, you know, some are lacing up their shoes in their car and I'm looking around and I'm starting to see a few people like getting out of their Ubers and walking on the side of the freeway up the hill, like <laughs> to then go up the off ramp while walking because the off ramp's completely closed and the police have brock- blocked it off. And I am normally like the, like, I'm not gonna say normally, like I like to make my own mold. Um, I challenge the rules that don't make sense. Um, and I looked at this, I looked at the time, I looked at my goal and I said, if we wait for for the permission to to go like to go we're not i'm not going to make it on time or it's highly unlikely that i'm going to make it on time along with you know time because you don't want to just start off running you want to do a little stretching a little warm up like you don't want to start off just like okay fresh out of sitting in a car for 45 minutes to then i'm going to run 26.2 miles you want to warm up your body and I looked, I looked at Spike and I saw these, you know, guys getting out of their cars or their Ubers, not, they weren't leaving their cars on the side. I'm, I'm highly like, you know, assum- making the assumption that it was, they were Ubering and from their conversations of, you know, when I got out of the car and chose to walk on the side of the freeway up the on-ramp, um, and getting yelled at, being the only one, by the way, who got yelled at by the police officer. Nobody else, you didn't yell at anybody else. And I just, I put my head down and I, I didn't say anything and I just, you know, he said, like, what do you think you're doing? And I'm like, I am just going to do this thing that is a choice. And I knew that, you know, not like I knew I I made the calculation and I made the judgment. And I said, this is what I'm going to choose to do. 
I'm not the only one choosing to to get out of my Uber and do this. I'm not doing this alone. Like, but at the same time, I also saw there were so many people doing it. And not that, you know, if everyone's jumping out of, off a cliff, like, d- are you going to jump off too? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I made a very calculated decision in that was in alignment with my goal to break some potential rules and choose to do something that I made a calculated risk assessment and said I'm choosing to take the risk. And so many people did. <laughs> Does that make it right? Does that make it wrong? We can think in those delineations, but I chose to take the risk to choose to do something that would allow me to achieve the goal. And that was such a powerful lesson because as someone who used to be a chronic people pleaser and always wanted to be perfect, always felt like I needed to play by all the rules and follow all the rules, that was such a big embodiment of this next phase of making choices that yes as you grow to do anything you will be taking calculated risks that may go against some current standards that may challenge certain systems and choosing to do that because you have this goal and this vision and it's not what's always been done is sometimes the right choice for you or the choice that I would say is the effective choice that actually gets you to achieve your goals. And it just comes down to how much risk are you willing to take? And I definitely made the calculated risk assessment of like consequences of ownership of my choice. And I said, I'm choosing to do this. I felt like it was a safe choice because like I said, completely stopped um, on the freeway. And I, we pulled over to the farthest of the farthest lane and I got out and like the many homeless people on the side of the street, just chose to walk and move. And that was so empowering to the, the belief system of making conscious choices and to choosing to do something. And so it was with that energy that I started the marathon of this, you know, full on embracing my Enneagram 8, the challenger of the status quo, the challenger of systems that may be ineffective. Um, Because like what my question was like, why did you block off the entire intersection and create this massive traffic backup? Like you could like easily could have moved people off like the, the accident off to the side. And it's just in that choice, like. This is where I started the marathon from as far as the energy is concerned. And oh my goodness, the lessons that then ensued from thenceforth changed my life. Let's go. Well, actually, let me start with this. I'm going to tell you a story because in 2018, I ran my first marathon after having my first child, Declan. It was a year after giving birth. And I thought... Oh my gosh, I've run, I think, how was that? Like four marathons, five marathons at that point? No, I think it was four. And I was like, I got this. My body knows what it's doing. I forgot though that like my last marathon that I had run was in 2013. So that was five years and a pregnancy where my body had shifted and changed and evolved. And that marathon hit me in the hubris. It punched my pride and beat it down like a little bitch. And I barely crossed the finish line. They literally were tearing the marathon stands down. My dad and my husband were holding up the finish line sign just so I could run under it. Like, that's how slow I was going. I went from running a 433 marathon to a 630 (laughs) that was brutal, baking in the sun. And oh, not to mention, this was a Boston Marathon qualifier. So most of the people were running like a 3.30 or less, um, 3.30 to maybe four hour marathon. Meanwhile, me and like the other mama who had just given birth as well, we were lagging behind at the sweet six and a half hour marathon time in the baking hot sun of October on the California coast. And 
this marathon because it was a smaller marathon. There weren't the cheering crowds of fans, of supporters like there are at the LA Marathon or other larger marathons. I was literally running past people like holding their beer cans because in this one uh, and this one road uh, between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara in uh, the little the in Ventura County, it's where you go and you park your RV and you're like literally on the beach and you go and you park it and you're there for a weekend. So I was there doing this marathon running past people who were like lackadaisically strolling out of their RVs with their beer or their mimosa or their wine cooler at like 11, having like the best life, time of their lives. And meanwhile, I'm there suffering, forcing myself to go through with it because I refuse, like I have the marathon mindset and this has been my mantra since ever starting running marathons back in 2011, that run, walk or crawl, I cross that damn finish line. So I am damn determined to cross it. But that marathon had me wanting to give up. And I will admit that that marathon put the fear of love and God in me to run another one. Like it definitely smacked me down hard. And I was grateful that it did because I learned so much. And I had to, once you've felt a loss like that, like where you thought you were really good at something, you thought you were like crushing it, you get smacked down like royally, you gotta pull yourself back up again. And like you're at that point where it is low. And in 2020, I signed up to run the LA Marathon in March. That obviously didn't happen because we were in, we had the opportunity to go to Australia and then we ended up staying because of uh, the pandemic. So then I was planning on running the Gold Coast Marathon, but then we ended up leaving Australia. Well, the first year it ended up being canceled because of COVID. And then the second year it ended up like we were moving before I could run it or I I was pregnant. Um, and then I was like, oh, okay, well, in 2022, I'll then run it then. And then we ended up moving back to California in January. So there were all of these like really well-intentioned desires to do it again, to run a marathon again, to go forth and do the training. But Honestly, like we all know, like you either get what you want, you get what you tolerate, um, you get what you settle for, and that which is unconscious manifests unhappily. And so every time, somehow, I just kept unconsciously manifesting this marathon running thing not happening. And then again, January, I was like committed. I was going to go in. I was like, ready. I bought my ticket for the Disney World Half Marathon, waited in line for two hours on the interwebs to get this ticket. And then of course, and I was planning on doing it with a couple friends of mine. They ended up not doing it, not getting their registration in because it closed really super fast. And I was like, okay, fine. I'm going to do it on my own. This is how it's meant to be. I meant to, you know, do this. And then I go forth and January, we end up moving to Texas. So the marathon was supposed to be on January 8th. Sure, could have I, you know, squeezed it in and like hopped on a plane, quickly flew to Orlando, ran a marathon, flew back, moved. Sure. Would that have driven my family absolutely bonkers? Yes. And because family is a higher value for me, I chose family. And we just decided collectively like that, you know, if the move was not settled, if the house purchase was not settled by the first week of January, that I would not run the marathon. And so that's what happened. And I made that decision and I said, okay, well, then I am still going to run a marathon. I had been training for six months, lightly training. And and by lightly training, I mean like running three, four miles on like three to four times a week, um, not doing really long distances, not going above 10 miles. I think the most I hit was nine miles. Um, and I did that right before we left uh, left Los Angeles. So that was Jan- early January, late December. And I had signed up for the LA Marathon. And I said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And it was perfect timing because it fit right in coordination with the mastermind that I was going to be going to. And I said, okay, this is happening. And then we get to moving and moving is, if you've ever moved, it's 
a lot. And if you've ever moved into a house, suddenly we had this house and I'm like, we need to fill this with furniture. We need to have furniture and we need to have a couch to sit on. We need furniture. So that took a few weeks and it really, I was not diligent with my training. I'm 100% honest about that. And so it really wasn't until the past month where I said, what is my intention for this marathon? What is my intention for running this? And I said, yes, a part of me had wanted to prove something to myself, which we know is an egoic construct. Yes, I also knew that running this would allow me to remember who I am because I knew that this marathon was going to unlock things in me, and it did, as you can tell, because I'm kind of getting a little emotional. I was not expecting that. Um, this would be my first marathon that my dad would not be cheering me on in person. My dad was always my greatest cheerleader when it came to me running, even though he was shocked and, you know, amazed that I could actually run a marathon because that was something he never even thought I could do, which I always love defying people's expectations. So that's that's a big win. That's the Enneagram 8 in me. But my dad, when I ran my first marathon, he was like fresh out of his back surgery. And yes, he was on heaps of opioids. But so I don't recommend what he did. Um, but what he did do meant a lot to me even though, again, I don't recommend what he did, but he defied his doctor's orders and he showed up in the 2011 marathon at mile 20 in a torrential downpour, like two weeks after his back surgery, just so that he could sit in a chair and cheer me on. He couldn't get up. He couldn't, you know, move around um, much, but he sat in a chair and cheered on every single one of the runners. And that was always, that was like the best part of my dad. That was my favorite part of my dad is he would be so generous with cheering people on to their dreams. And this was going to be the first that I was not going to ex experience that um, in person. And I know that my dad and I have a phenomenal relationship now that he has passed. Um, he is my guide from the other side. And I realized that a part of me avoiding my training was the fact that I didn't want to face that reality. And so it was in a, the next day after I had that breakthrough during a run, by the way, I then two days later ran my, I, I said I needed to at least hit double digits in my runs. And so I did my first 10 mile. That was all I trained up to. I didn't run crazy 15, 20, 26 miles. I actually have never trained for marathons in that way. Um, not, again, don't recommend it. But I have always, like, I always believe that if I get up to mile 13, I'm going to finish. Because if I get even halfway, I'm crossing that finish line, period. But I wanted to bring forth, because, you know, our bodies know more, much more than our brains do. And that's why movement of our bodies is so essential to our sovereignty, to our breakthroughs, to our growth, to our evolution. Because the body will reveal certain things to you that you may not you may not be aware of consciously because the body is the domain of the subconscious mind. So it was through running 26.2 miles that I had a few very pivotal breakthroughs of awareness, you know, and I first, my first big breakthrough with running this marathon was because of the stress of moving, because of the stress of, of the process uh, that went into manifesting our house and this home, which is a, another, an, for another, a save for another podcast episode, because it literally was practicing the art of detachment and surrender, like full motherfucking surrender <laughs> to receive this. So that'll definitely be another podcast episode. But this one because of that challenge and the stress and the moving and the, the process and then doing that with two babies and my mother and my husband and getting all that and then moving to a different state, moving to a place where suddenly now we have 10 acres and, you know, three donkeys, then four goats, um, two uh, animals pregnant and three chickens. And suddenly like, oh my gosh, it's a completely li like lifestyle transformation, complete 180 quantum leap, like quantum leap. 
my body and my nervous system was shot and what it needed was rest. And I kept on living into this mantra, like, if I'm going to finish this marathon, the number one thing I needed to focus on was rest. And so that's what I did for the, um, for the, the week prior and even before that. I really concentrated on getting my meditations in on a regular basis and meaning one a day at bare minimum, two a day typically, and then getting my sleep because that was the most essential piece. I knew that I would not be able to fare and do the 26.2 miles, do, do that amount of length without having my body having the reset of sleep. Sleep is just my best friend recently. And the more I'm leaning into that, the more excitement energy I'm actually having during the day, which is actually creating far more progress. Maybe that's just the fact that I'm a projector in human design and energy is and rest is so essential and I don't operate the same as generators. But that piece of like, I just knew intuitively, like my sleep was my priority. (laughs) Like that was, and so the week prior, like everything was, okay, who's sleeping with the the children? Like how, like, how are we going to navigate that? Which child is the best one to to sleep with? Because Declan's been wanting some extra cuddles. And then Colton, obviously we, we still co-sleep with Colton. We love it co-sleeping. Um, it's been a, we did it with both children and it's just brought so much connection, but it, you know, depends on what their sleeping schedule is and what they're doing as well. So we, we were, it was really a navigatory, if that's even a word, process of how, and and I was so grateful for my support network of being able to understand that. Um, the second, so once I had the sleep like on lock, the second thing that I really had to have an awareness of was as I was running the marathon, the first breakthrough. So we start, we, we're moving. I've gotten my rest. Like I, I felt really amazing. I felt great going into it and I had committed. I made the full body decision after that run where I realized what I was actually avoiding was the, the reality. And I realized that in this marathon that I was going to face that reality and of that my dad is past and you know that that would be something that i would have to like this was like the final goodbye not only to la but to my father and i knew that and so i went into this marathon knowing that i was probably going to bring up some feels and i also went in with a full bodied commitment that i was going to finish the two goals that i set very very clear one be better than the time that I did the 2018 marathon. So 2018, I finished around like 6.30. I said, I just want to finish in under six hours. That's it. I just want to finish in under six hours, period. And I wanted to make sure that I finished without injury, like with, you know, feeling good, feeling vibrant, because I literally was going from the marathon into the mastermind, which the party started that evening, and then three days of intensive all day, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. at night, classes, networking, speakers, all of that. So it was like from one marathon to another. So I knew I didn't want to go into that half-assed either. I didn't want to go into that feeling completely dead like I felt after the 2018 marathon. So I said, I want to feel vibrant. I want to feel alive. And so I want to, I want, I had those two goals, which could seem like they were in opposites. And I wanted to make sure that I did it without injury. So making sure that my body felt really good crossing that finish line. Like not now injury is different than pain. I I was fully accepting that, you know, with every physiological challenge, there will be physiological pain to a degree. Um, But I'll get more on that in a in a in a hot minute. So but I knew I was going to feel some things. I knew I was going to allow my body to feel what it needed to feel. But I wanted to make sure that I didn't injure it in the process of going for it. So this is really about the construct of the energy of which I was running, which I wasn't going to run with force. That was what I did in the 2018 marathon. I was running to prove myself. I was running with this force energy rather than true intrinsic sourcing power from the universe and from the infinite potential that my body has and from expanding the actual capacity of my body to withhold and maintain and, and sustain and expand in its own capacity of energy. So those are the two goals that I had going into this marathon. 
So we start out and, you know, if you've ever run a marathon, it's a big crowd at first and then you're kind of like bobbing and weaving the first, I would say the first two miles of any marathon, you're kind of navigating through the people who are running (laughs) and then through my new, like, I I would say trigger because I definitely was triggered in this, Um, but because I had to work through my own judgments and offenses because I ran marathons back in 2011 and 2012 before there were selfies. And so as you're running, like people were stopping in the middle of the running path to take a selfie or to like slow down. And so like you're bobbing and weaving. So it's like, it's less of a marathon. It's more of an obstacle course to get through those like first, it's more of like a gauntlet to get through of those first two miles. And I had to work through like, oh, my annoyance and frustration and my own judgments with, um, with the people stopping to take selfies and like pausing and seeing all the, you know, because it's a really profound, beautiful energy that's in this space when you are with a collective group of 22,000 people going for the same goal. It's a, it's an energy and it is palpable and it is so cool. And I understand wanting to be able to capture it. And it's annoying as fuck to try to like dance around it. So I'm like, because, uh, you know, there's that inertia piece. And so if someone's, is, if you're moving forward and someone stopped, there's that inertia piece of, of crashing. And that was what I was completely unavailable for. So it was, it was the gauntlet and I was okay with that. Once I, you know, that was my first lesson to, to work through my own judgments and, and, and just see like, okay, this is this first two miles, not a marathon gauntlet, go, Bob, weave, Spartan, like, let's go. <laughs> Don't knock other people down, like focusing on really positive language. Find the people who are keeping a pace, lean in with them, find your pack. So as you're running, and as I was running, I was finding my pack, finding people that were had a similar pace. Now, when you start a marathon, you're typically running with people in the same pace. So like I knew I was going to be running about a 12 minute mile and I used to run a 10, but I'm okay. I surrendered my pride <laughs> and I knew I was going to run a, a, a 12 minute mile because I could do that successfully without injury for, for a, a sustained amount of time. So because I knew that, I knew that I would be running at that pace and I was looking for people, feeling out people because you're literally feeling their energy as you're running past them, feeling out the people whose pace that I could match. And so this was such a, this was like, aha, big breakthrough, like massive breakthrough. Number one was you will be at a pace for some and then move to a new pace and a new pack. So when you are in your sympathetic nervous state, there are, you know, we've heard of fight, flight, freeze, but there's also flock where you are in your tribe, you're in your group, you're in your, you're with your people. And then you may outgrow that group. And that outgrowth of that group is, can be scary biologically as fuck. Because biologically, we are wired that that person who steps outside of the group, those are, those are the ones that get eaten by wolves. Like that, that's our human biology. So when you're running a marathon, you're going to be, because it's such an individualized event, you are going to be finding people whose pace you match, who you may pace with for a while, and then who you may evolve outside. So it's a constant progression, especially like if you stop for bathroom breaks like I do, like I'm not the marathon runner who chooses to pee themselves. That's just not my choice. Um, I fully am okay with taking a hot second to go use a proper porta potty. Um, but you will move your pace, like your pace, your, your flock who you group with will adapt it and, and you will, you will change that pace and find those people who on it. It's, it's almost like as you're running, there's not like a, like, oh, you're running at this pace. I'm running at this pace. Let's go run together. It's like an almost energetic agreement of like, you're just, you're just holding the space for each other to be in the same pace at the same time. It's like, it's the coolest energy. It's, it is so cool. And it is also such a powerful business one that I found over the past year, especially with really choosing to consciously pace myself with friends, innovators, changing the environment of the people that I surround myself with, because those paces like there are certain paces that I'm choosing to run it, choosing to run it, like listen to the language very carefully, that I know that I'm I'm outpacing some people that I used to pace with before business wise 
And that doesn't necessarily mean financially. That just means like we're running toward a different goal. Like maybe if you're running toward a 10K a month goal, um, that's something that I've already passed. And so we may have been running together for a while. So you may be in a in a group. Like when I first started coaching, I joined this uh, group coaching program. And I knew that I was joining the program more for the community than for the um, than for the content, because I had a feeling in my gut, like I already knew the content. I'd done so many programs around, um, coaching and building an online business. And I'd done, I have multiple access to like so many courses, but I knew that this one I was really joining specifically for the community because I was moving from being, uh, pregnant to being a mompreneur for the first time. And I knew that I needed some community around me to support me in that transition. But through that community, I eventually, paced myself differently. And some people are no longer coaching. Some people have pivoted their businesses. Some people have, you know, it's, so we've gone on different paths and, that the, and that's okay. But there's the, the tribe that you start with. And then you may outpace that current tribe and then you pivot and go to another one. And so you're constantly bound, you, you, you can be moving communities and that's okay. Because as you grow, especially if you're on a path and, and in, with an intention for quantum leaping, for really exponential growth, you're going to be changing your flock more often than not. And and that's okay. And marathon running was such a power, especially this marathon, was such a powerful awareness to that truth of like, okay, I paced with this one. I remember this one guy, we were in this space and pace, and we were pacing together for probably about two miles, like just naturally, like running side by side. No, no, not, we didn't say a word to each other. There was just, I knew he had the pace. And then, Like he eventually there was a friend that found him and then he just went off and and paced a little faster. And that's fine. Totally fine. Like I knew I was like, okay, I'm on my own. Okay, I'm on my own again. All right. I'm on my own. Okay, well, let's find that next flock. Let's find that next pace. And so that's where we constantly allow and it's the literal biological and physiological training of the body that it is safe to find your new flock when you are outpacing your current one. It is totally safe. Um, that was a huge lesson. Then as we kept running, um, there was this one guy with a sign and God bless West Hollywood. I absolutely love running through West Hollywood and the LA marathon because there was this one guy with a sign and my body was getting, it was getting tired. Like it wasn't where we crossed around, like he was in hall. I saw him first on Hollywood. And then this, the coolest thing with marathon crowds, especially for bigger marathons, like city wide marathons, is there are some people who are cheering who will then you'll see them again, like 10 miles later or five miles later. And they're like, they'll be there. And then they'll be five miles later. They'll be like 10 miles down the road. So it's, it's really cool to see. And there's this one guy um, who I saw in Hollywood and then in West Hollywood, and he had the most beautiful sign. And it said, when your legs are too tired, run with your heart. And it was such a reminder for me because I, coming from my Pilates background, I know that, yes, I can run with my legs. Like, my legs are strong, but that's not where, that, that your legs are an extremity. Your arms are an extremity. They're stemming out of your core. Where you really run from, where your body really moves from, everything stems from your core. Your chakras are in your core. Everything stems from this core. So the the physiological core, you know, the core values, if we think of it metaphorically, if we think of it on a metaphysical level, like the the core of who you are, everything stems out of the core. Every So you don't want to run with your extremities. You don't want to run with the outside things. You actually, when you run from the place of your core, metaphorically, spiritually, emotionally, physiologically even, because how you do anything, how you do everything, the physiological core, when you run from that core, it changes how you run and you can actually run farther and faster. And that reminder of just seeing that sign, which is why it's so important to surround yourself with signs, verbiage, things of inspiration, words. For me, it's words. It's, I, I, in our home, like there are so many words that I just see that it, I'm putting up conscientiously. Everything I'm putting up in my home is 1000% intentional to evolve me into who I'm working to be every single day of who I'm evolving into being every single day. So 
when I saw that sign, it was such a reminder to not only run from my core of like the physiological core of my of having the rotation in my, in my run to to power through the obliques through the abdominals to then th- through the transverse abdominis to pull up and in through the core so that all the abdominal wall is engaged as you're moving forward because that's what's really going to create that tor- that um the torque the the propulsion but beyond that it was the heart, the emotions, and that it was after seeing that sign that a couple miles later, um, it was around mile 15, I started running through Beverly Hills. And that's when I started to notice knee pain. And I was like, fuck. Initially, that was my first response. I was like, holy fuck. No, no, I have 11 miles left not knee pain right now cuz that's what that was where my injuries were in the past and specifically the 2018 um marathon the i could barely walk like i was hobbling so that was my initial reaction was a past reference was the physiological memory of what had happened in the past and then that's when the coach came out and if you work with me or when you work with me, when you decide, um, you'll know that every session before it, I have a pre-coaching form. And in that pre-coaching form, I always ask the question, what's been happening with your body in the past week or since our last session? Why? Because the body is the domain of the subconscious mind. And if you study the new German medicine paradigm or read uh, the secret language of your body, New German medicine paradigm is, is, will just blow you away. Um, literally what they can see is for every single dis-ease, ailment, issue, cons- they'll see, you'll see concentric rings on an MRI scan in the brain as to where a specific traumatic event happened. So they trace it to literally everything from macular degeneration to cancer to, um, to knee issues, whatnot. So stu- having studied that to a degree and and knowing what the body that the body represents certain things if you think of the metaphorical representation of your body of this of this meat sack that we're in the metaphor of certain joints of certain mobility points in your body is a metaphor for what's you're currently going through and where was my knee pain my right knee so the right knee right side masculine side left side more fe- feminine so right side um, and and right side masculine feminine also depends on which is your dominant side as far as whether you're left handed right handed or um, more left brain right brain. Um, but traditionally, most often, eighty percent of the time, right side masculine, left side feminine. So I knew right side masculine moving forward. Okay, my dad always would be mile twenty, mile fifteen what's coming up soon. So that was when I felt the knee pain. I accepted it. I acknowledged it. And that what does the knee joint do? The knee allows your legs, your body to physiologically move forward. So I knew I was going to be moving forward. This was a a piece of moving forward. So as I accepted the pain, because if you resist it, if you force it, if you're like, no, this shouldn't be happening. No, that's, that's gonna, that's what I did every single past marathon where I'd ended up with an injury. So I said, hey, what the heck? Like, let's try this, this thing that I've done successfully in my business and in my life. Let's move up the scale of, of emotional vibration into the place of acceptance. Because otherwise, if you're in the shoulds, then you're feeling the shame or the guilt that you're feeling the thing that you're feeling and you can't, you're in denial, which can also lead to anger, which can, you know, it's, you're in all the lower vibratory states of consciousness. So I said, okay, I'm going to accept that this is what it is. What, and I literally asked the part of my body, I asked my right knee, I said, what are you here to show me? What do you need to reveal to me? And it just brought up a well of emotions and I felt it and I knew and I said okay this is moving forward this is goodbye this is letting go I got this 
And I allowed myself, instead of forcing myself to run, instead of pushing through and saying, no, I got to run at this point. It's a marathon. I run it. I said, I'm going to, I just felt my body say, just walk, feel this space, let yourself move, let yourself go, let yourself do the thing. And I kept allowing that, that space. And it took about two miles and then it processed. It fully processed. I said, okay, I'm allowing myself to let this go. I knew this was tied to grief. I knew this was tied to the, the passing of my father. And I knew that this was my body's like, okay, that masculine force that was such a dominant influence in my life is not there or is not there in the way that it has been, which is positive in some respects and negative in others. Like, or not negative, but you know, I miss the, the, the cheerleader in my dad, the, the positive part of him being gone is like the addiction pieces is, is no longer a thing that I'm needing to help him work through or feeling obligated to, to help. He's, he's free of that. And so I felt it, I was with it. And then I did the thing that I, at the beginning of the marathon, I felt like such a hypocrite, but I allowed myself to laugh at my, uh, my own judgments of like my own judgmental self, because one of the things that I had noticed as I was running, Declan is very much into money manifestation and he loves finding money. And whenever he finds money on the street, he we celebrate it like we just won the lottery, like pe from a, a penny to a dime to whatever. And as I was running from the very like first mile on, I saw so much money in the street like so much money. And it was such a powerful lesson of money is always around us. It's always abundant. It's always present. And you just got to reach down and pick it up. Like you just got to tap in. You just got to choose to reach down and pick it up. But I, I, and every time I passed it, because I didn't want to be that person who was stopping creating inertia and um, stymieting other people in their, in their progress. So I ch made the conscious choice. Okay. Like, oh, I, I passed up like at least a dollar in, uh, in spare change that I found, um, as I was just, that I saw as I was running. And every time I thought of Declan and I thought of his reaction of how excited he gets for every penny and every dime that he finds. And I'm like, no, this is my run. I'm choosing to not pick this up. I'm choosing to not tap this in, but I am recognizing how abundant this universe is. I am recognizing that all I have to do is make a choice to just reach out and pick it up. <laughs> and so then as I was run, as I was walking, uh, through Beverly Hills, um, I saw a penny and I reached and I was like, this is what it just called to me. And I said, I am going to make the choice that I'm going to have a penny for Declan when I see him. Um, and I picked it up. And of course, I got the looks from the other runners who were like, ah, God damn it, lady. Like <laughs> we were in, you're in our path. And I was really trying to be as considerate as possible. But it was such a moment of like, oh, my gosh, here's my karma. <laughs> like this was my karma for all my judgment in the beginning. <laughs> totally coming back. I'm okay with that. Okay. I had the penny. It was, I, <laughs> I didn't pick up any more money after that, but I just, I had that penny and I knew that that would bring Declan a lot of joy. So I was so grateful for that. And then it was after finding that penny that I, I just, I felt that the, the renewed sense in my body that running, yes, running was okay again. And my knee was fine. My knee was a hundred percent fine. And so this is the thing about emotions. Emotions are energy in motion. It's energy moving through your body. And so the pain was not the pain. The pain was just a symbol that there was repressed emotions in my unconscious mind that needed to work their way out that were specific to the joint of moving forward and moving on after the, the passing of my dad. So I like, I was like, oh my gosh, the body is such a wondrous, a wondrous gift. It was, it was phenomenal to be able to, to feel that experience that, see that in real time. Like I've experienced that multiple times, but to do that on this 26.2 mile journey and to know that like, oh my gosh, my body was totally fine. I was running predominantly for another four miles after that. It felt amazing. And then my knee got a little tight, like my knees written and hips were specifically, and my hips were getting a little tired and I could definitely feel the hip strain in my lower pelvis and, and butt and in the hips. 
And I knew I was like, okay, unconscious mind, like what next, what are the next emotions that you're bringing up for me? And what are the next experiences? What are the the next things that I need to process? And if you think about the base of your spine, if you think about your, the base of your pelvis, it is a basin. It is your root chakra. It is the space where you are. um, It is the roots. And that was such a powerful metaphor because we have been so uprooted these past two years, uprooted from Australia, uprooted from California, planting our roots in Texas, buying a house, like creating those roots again, like re up uprooting from, from if you've ever lost a parent, then there is this experience of like you are rooting yourself into a new identity that no longer attaches to that former person of who you felt you had to be for your caregivers. It's a, it's such a powerful and trans, transformative experience, um, losing a parent and because you're literally setting down new roots. And so I knew that it was this concept of like literally my nerve endings and my pelvis, my body was is is in the formation phase of creating new new roots energetically into this life that we're consciously creating as far as what we want to create based off of the fact that our past has prepared us for everything to 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 go forth and, and do everything that we're wanting to manifest in the, in this world and knowing that i'm like okay i'm creating new roots new roots of belief systems new roots of embodying those beliefs on a whole another level i mean just the the process of purchasing this house was this whole embodiment of like do you really believe in the attachment in, in, in detaching in surrender in faith like do you have such full faith and the answer was yes. Do you have courage to say no? Do you have courage to hold your boundaries to what you will and will not accept? Like those were all deeply rooted lessons through the purchasing process of this house. And then moving from that process into this marathon of like saying goodbye to my childhood home and that saying goodbye to my childhood city. And then letting like knowing that I'm planting new roots for my family so that my kids will grow up in a totally new city and it new roots for my children, knowing that that we are rooting them into a home and a family after, you know, five years. I mean, Declan has moved five times. I mean, if you don't count the six moves we did in Australia to different uh, Airbnbs or apartments, um, Declan's moved once a year, pretty much every year of his life. And this was such a new experience of like, since we moved in, to our home in Texas, he's been asking me like, mama, like, are we going to spend Christmas here? Are we like, where are we going to move back? Like, and finally he's starting to grasp the concept that like, this is our forever home. Like this is where home base is. Like, this is what we're building here. And that's, that's new for him. Like that's something like I never experienced. I, I lived, I grew up living in the same house and a whole different construct of what a home was versus like the construct that Spike and I are building is that our home is our family. Our home is wherever we are as a family and the location is fluid. But I realized that Declan being five years old, he really needed that concrete foundation of like, this is where we live. This is, this is, he needed a little less fluidity and a little bit more structure and foundation for the beginnings of his beautiful life. Um, and same with Colton too. Um, Colton's just a little newer to the world. And so he hasn't experienced as much as many moves and he won't experience as many as Declan did. Um, and so they're both going to have different life experiences in this beautiful imprint period of, of their lives. It's going to shape who they are as humans. So this whole concept of rooting in, creating roots is was was coming through my body in in such a holistic way. It was coming through my body in a holistic way to where I felt my hips, my pelvis readjusting. Also, you know, readjusting after, you know, being the bearer of two children. I knew that this was also me rooting into my body, me back into me rather than me being into the vessel for creating another human. Like I'm not, I am planning on creating another human eventually again. Um, but I, this year it's about me 
And I've been very clear with that. And I'm super excited for the evolution of who I'm birthing. But it did also feel in a way kind of like like I was pregnant again, like the same similar pelvic pain to a degree of like the stretching of the pelvis, the engagement of the fascia, like it felt like that. And I was like, oh, this is just me b- literally birthing from my chakras, the the next level version of who I am. Like this is my my body preparing to be that vessel to be the emergence of the next level. Um, and that was my body showing that gift to me, which I was super stoked about. And yet also it was challenging. So that caused a bit of challenge up until like I, I, I was walking, running a bit more, shifting between the two, between like mile 19 and mile um, 21. But I knew, or at least I, I hoped, I really hoped that my family would be there at mile 22. Like my, my dad always, uh, my dad and mom always met me around like mile 19, 20. But I knew that the way the course was mapped out, that the best place for my family to see me and meet me, like just logistically, was be would be around mile 22. And of course, that's the number that I've been seeing repeatedly on repeat. That's like been the angel number that's been guiding me since 2020. So I've been seeing it so often and so repeatedly. In fact, <laughs> I kept on trying to record this podcast and we we're running into different audio issues. And of course, it, the timestamp kept on moving to 2.2. I was like, okay, thank you, God Angels Universe. I know you got my back with this podcast episode. I know this is going to serve. Awesome. So as I was, I, I had the faith and I had been like slightly updating Spike on where where I was. I'm just saying like mile 19. And I didn't know this until later, but uh, like they got there literally probably about seven minutes right before I passed. But they were there. And that was the most exciting moment for me because I knew that as I was running past, I wanted to be a demonstration to my children of A, what is possible, and B, committing. And I didn't want them to see me in pain. I wanted to see them to see me strong. I didn't because I, I wanted to show that you can keep going for a goal. You can choose strength. You can choose to keep going. And so that mile 22, I chose to run. And I had been hoping that it would rain a little bit. I'm going to be honest, because I did like it was a downpour in my first marathon um, of 2011, which was such a transformative marathon for me. I literally ran that marathon, kept running past the finish line in 2011 into the place where I was supposed to have my wedding reception to my then um, first husband who we had eloped before he had deployed. And then we were going to have an official wedding when he got back. I kept running. I realized through that marathon that he was not the one for me, um, that it was not a relationship that was going to be conducive to the furthering of my evolution if I stayed in it. And I kept running past the finish line in a torrential downpour where only a third of the marathon runners actually finished and 100 people got hypothermia because it was freezing. And I kept running and I canceled our wedding reservations. So I like having rain at a marathon, I would run in the rain all day. Running in the hot sun, forget it. But running in the rain, I, I wanted rain. I really did. And as I'm running, I start to feel like these sprinkles. And I'm like, okay, I feel like that this is that this is like, that my, I had, a, I was like, oh, please let them be there. Please let them be there. And I see the mile 22 sign and I don't see them at it. And then I see the text and I look down and I see the note of just like, just look for the, the woman ra- <laughs> flying her scarf. And my mom had like a scarf that she was w- waving around and she was, they were literally, I looked down, had the gut intuition, look at the, looked at, saw the text and then kept running. And as I ran, my dad's song that, like, he loved Andrea Bocelli. And my playlist is all, like, a, it, it's an amalgamation of different styles. But there's this one song um, that Andrea Bocelli, I believe, sings with his son. And I heard it the first time, like, a year after my dad passed. And I knew that it was him speaking to me through through the collective unconsciousness of whoever created that song. Like I just, I knew it felt so clear. And as soon as I'm running past the, as soon as I like see the kids, like right before I see them, 
the song comes on and I know, I know he's there. I know like that even though he's not there anymore present in this physical reality, I know he's there for me. And it was in that space that then I see my kids and I see Declan and he's cheering me on and Colton's like wondering what the fuck is going on and who are all these people and what are they doing? And my mom is cheering me on and Spike is and I'm like stripping off my jacket because I was hot, but I had to keep the jacket on to prevent from some cha- underarm chafing. Um, And then I knew that like I'm taking off the jacket and I tell Declan, I'm like, there's a penny in it. There's a surprise for you. And he's so excited. He's like, yay, mama, you're going to win the golden trophy. And <laughs> I just had this overwhelming, just pure sense of how loved and supported I am. And it was so profound. And the biggest thing that lesson that I learned from that is like, the importance of a cheering squad. I have seen so many people, you know, especially in the coaching industry, who are like, I don't need a cheerleader. Like, I need, you know, strategy and all this. I'm like, you fucking need a cheerleading section. You need someone who is in your corner who shows up for you regardless. You need someone to show up. Showing up means showing up and you show up for them. And when you show up for them, that presence of them just choosing to be there and choosing to be that supporting character in the 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 hair in your heroine or hero's journey is so essential to you achieving what it is that you want to create and achieve in this world you need a cheering squad i don't care who your cheering squad is choose them find them gather them around and hold them close, and then do the same for others. Be other people's cheering squad. We need that in this world because the abundance of love that you will feel when people show up for you is enormous. And if you want people to show up for you, show up for them. And that was such a beautiful moment for me and it inspired me. And as soon as it happened, literally I kept running uh, probably not even a half a mile. And then the rain came and it just poured over me. And I knew this was God and I knew it was grace. And I knew it was the universe saying, let this transform you. Let this lean you into who you need to be. Let this be this thing that you wanted it to be. Choose that. And it's a choice. And I felt it and I, and I kept moving forward. And as I was, was moving through toward the finish line, I finally see, you know, mile 25, 26, and I see the finish line and it's in sight. And I say this like a hundred percent, not to brag, but I know that who I am meant to be in this world is someone who is cheering and championing on others, because that is something that is so necessary in this world. It is so necessary to have people in your corner. And I was running toward the finish line and I see this guy and he is hobbling and he is hurting and I can tell. And I, and I look at him and I say, come on, we're going to cross this together. And I, I feel the energy, like there is an energy that is palpable when you are almost so close to crossing that finish line and you want to, and you want to do it and you want to do it strong and you want to do it feeling good. And I kept the, I slowed down my own pace. I saw the clock and I, I said, I still had, the clock said five hours and 50 minutes. It was really about five hours and 41 according to my, my own timing, um, but I, I knew that I had 10 minutes to cross and, and be able to, at, at, at the bare ass minimum, uh, at the max 10 minutes. Um, I probably had more than that, but according to the actual timestamp clock that was on the major overhang that says like, here's the big timing. Um, and I knew I could still cross, meet my goal. I was not injured. I could still cross under six, six hours. And I knew that I, would not be able to feel like I cross strong if I didn't help this guy cross with me. And I saw, because I saw him and I felt his pain. 
I felt the challenge that he was under. And I knew he, he, he probably, he, he was so close to crossing, he would have crossed. But just having that encouragement and being able to be that for him and, and say, like, let's cross this together. That felt so good for me. And he, him after, he lit up, like his energy just shifted. And I said, we got this. Like, and, you know, there were a couple of times where I could see he, he was struggling and I, I slowed my pace down. I said, okay, let's, let's, we're crossing this together. And he was so grateful. And he was, he uh, later was turned to me and he was like, thank you so much for helping me. Because it's just that little bit of kindness, that little act of, of kindness of just saying, we're going to cross this together. We're going to go through this together. You are not alone in this. Marathon running, just like life, can feel very solitary, just like entrepreneurship. It can feel very solitary, especially when you're, you know, alone in a podcasting booth or alone behind your computer or at a coffee shop. Like you may be surrounded by people, but you're not connecting. And if if you can cho- truly just choose to lean into those relationships who you may not 100% know and just lean into the desire to really connect under the shared banner of a of a mission to cross a, f- a finish line that you both see as valuable and meaningful to you and to support one another in crossing that together, it's a game changer for your performance. I crossed that finish line feeling so strong, feeling so invigorated, feeling so like I was embodying the fullest potential of who I could be that I even was able to, <laughs> after the marathon, I had to find my car um, and where where my family was. And 22,000 people ran this marathon. So there was a lot of traffic to say the least. And after the marathon, I was riding on such a high that I was going beyond what I thought was possible. And I said, okay, like, let's, like, I, I'm going to keep walking until I find my car. And like, Spike was pi- parked like a mile away and we had to like drive to meet each other. But that experience of just being able to help somebody else cross, I felt so good and felt so alive after that, that like, and that's what I feel every time my clients achieve a goal. Every time they, they wh- whatever goal it is, whether it's financial, business, they hire the best team. They reconnect with their estranged children. They they discover a new way to connect on uh, with their partners. Whatever it is, I see, hear, feel, and know that it is in that space of just helping others cross their finish lines. That that is where I just light up, and it is it is everything to me. And all of those lessons combined were ingrained and etched in my bones now and just in being able to share this with you I was able to experience that again so if you've listened this long like thank you so much and if you have and you found this and my stories to be of value to you please share this with a friend who is going for their own marathon goal maybe it's not necessarily running a marathon but maybe they're doing something that is going to require them to go the extra mile metaphorically, to challenge themselves, be that cheerleader for them, send this to them. And I thank you so much in advance for passing this along. As always, own your throne, mind your business, because your reign is now. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If what you heard resonated with you, be sure to subscribe and start creating a bigger impact now by sharing this with a friend. Just by doing that one simple act of kindness, you are creating a royal ripple to support more people in their sovereignty. And if you're not already following on social media, connect with me everywhere at crownyourself.now for more inspiration. I am so excited to connect with you in the next episode. And in the meantime, go out there and create a body, business, and life that rules. Because today, you crown yourself.